and expediting with Lucy here. I am inside the Yankee Air Museum. And these are the people that make these museums possible. These are the people that donate their time and their money because there's no taxes or government dollars that go towards these things. And these are the heroes that make these museums happen. This is the Willow Run Airport, which had the Willow Run plant that we produced B-24s during the war, and Rosie the Riveter worked here. I'll talk more about that later, but that's the sign they got the most people to ever dress up like Rosie the Riveter, which I thought was kind of cool. Another group of those. Like I said, I'll talk more about that in a minute. Working on munitions, welding, cool hair. I'm going to come down here, it's going to get loud, these people are babbling, but I'll get by them as fast as I can. So I'll walk into the main part of the museum. I got to do because he, you know, he just wasn't quite his thing, so he joined the Navy. All right, this is one small display of World War I equipment. These are the uh, true Vikings of the air. This is a, uh, a spot. It's one of the main fighter planes they made. I think these things had a crew, cha a crew speed, of, uh, speed of like 90 knots or something. And how difficult this was to fly. If you look at the wing, it's wood and it's hollow. You could literally walk up to this plane and tear it up with your bare hands. This uh, apparently doesn't have a motor, it's just a mock-up, but if there was an engine in here and you removed it, you could probably pick this airplane up and walk away with it. And if you remember by watching all the movies, you always see the pilots wearing that 10, 12 foot long white scarf. It's not a fashion statement. It's because of this engine, which the technology of the era is low tech. The engines were very sloppy, they're very loose. There was a lot of unspent fuel coming out the exhaust. There was oil sputtering out the engine. And you can see the, the glass cockpit up in there. You don't get to hide behind the cockpit when you fly in combat. You have to be poked up high. So you're sticking up high and you got your head on a swivel and that scarf was a rag. And you would literally take the rag and pull it to wipe off your goggles because you were constantly getting sprayed with exhaust and oil everywhere you went. Now you do wear a piece of scarf around your neck because your head is on a swivel at all times and eventually it tears into your skin unlike the movies where the hero is always looking forward you're actually spending three quarters of your time looking behind you somebody managed to maintain and hold on to some of the original flying gear that's like a wool old goggles the unit <laughs> this is aviation started getting off the ground this is a radial engine a very large radial engine it's actually standing upright it's the last uh, engine this talks about it here the lighting is really getting in the way but it talks about it it's the, the last motors they made the radial and when I go to the corner, I'll talk more about the radial engine. It's my favorite. This is a World War I uniform, and it's up on a stand for a reason because that guy, if they put him on a scale, he probably weighed 120 pounds. That is a tiny uniform compared to people today. Again, how people manage to hold on to these is a mystery in different style. And that's a very specific person right there. And there's that engine, but again, I'll talk about the radial here in a second. Rosie the Riveter. Rosie the Riveter. When the war started, the, uh, the industries had to start booming and making bigger production, so they needed to expand their plants and get more employees. At the exact same time, the employees were going off to war. And at that time in, in uh, history, women stayed home. Women you know, stayed in the house. Well, they started hiring women and training them, and they were completely capable of building aircraft building machine guns, packaging ammunition. They did absolutely everything. And that red polka dot hat is the symbol of Rosie the Riveter. And somebody kept their original toolbox. And I think that's really awesome. The kind of equipment they used to hammer and beat and attach and, and drill bits, but kept their original toolbox. I'll walk around the other side over here. 
This is an A4 Skyhawk. It's a 1960s fighter plane, subsonic, single pilot. It's uh, important to know that it had a pair of 20 millimeter cannons on it, which was not normal for the era, which I'll talk about that here in a little, in a little while. Single pilot, very simple. Uh, these were used by the U.S. military, by the Navy. They sold them overseas in the Falklands Wars. The Argentine Navy, actually, their, their military was flying these. It is a carrier-borne aircraft. This is their Korean War display. Well, outfit, that's a little M1. I actually owned one of those for a long time. And this is the pilot outfit and the survival guide. The stuff I actually went through that kind of training how to how to survive. Seer, survival, escape, resistance, and evasion. He's even got a bug hat. That is your find me hat also in the water. You can be found with that. And in, in a pinch it can be used to hold hold water, which is kind of a good idea. And there's the reflector right there. That's the mirror you use to signal with. And the technique of doing that is you would take the mirror and hold your fingers like this and aim it at your target and then you'd move around like this until it would reflect between your fingers. It's actually quite effective. I thought this was an ejection seat, but it's not. It's just a seat. And if you ever get in an ejection seat and you fire, you sit up straight, you go out, and your military career is probably over because your back is going to be screwed up. This is old school rations. I joined in 86 and the, the metal containers were gone. It was just all plastic bags. They used to actually give you cigarettes back in the day. And this is the stuff I had, the plastic bag food. But that right there, a fruit cocktail, that's the most popular of the era. But wow, that's going way back. Alrighty. This here is a Coast Guard display, probably going back a ways. Cool helmet. Uh, that is an old helicopter that got retired a long time ago. I actually got pulled out of the Gulf of Mexico by a guy wearing a helmet just like that when I went in a drink in 2002. Go around here real quick. This is the Allison engine. Like I said, I'm kind of zigzagging here. The Allison engine used in the P-38 Lightning. That's a P-38 Lightning. Wonderful engine, reliable, powerful good production. Like I said, this is the Willow Run bomber plant was on this site and they assembled B-24s and that gives you an idea of how many they made. They, they put these out like they threw these bombers into the sky like rice at a wedding. Can't really tell but right there, that's a female by the way. And this shows the assembly process. milling around. That shows you how big this is. A B-24 is much bigger than a B-17 bomber. Let's circle back. This is a radial engine right here. Two rows, nine cylinders. Air-cooled makes it much more simplistic than what the Air Force used because they were liquid-cooled and you can't have leaky liquids if you don't have liquid. And this makes the noise that most people associate with aviation and it is the most soothing, calming sound you will ever hear out of an aircraft. And if you hear one fly over, its resonance and its warble will sound like it's idling. And I would highly recommend you go on YouTube and look up the sound of a radial engine flying over to understand that sound. It, would, it can make any bad day good. And these are some of the uniforms, again, tiny, in the war. This guy's got a jacket and a bomber pilot used to wear these. This one just time wore it out. It says Chapel in the Flak. And each one of those represents a bombing mission that this person's been on old. Technical Sergeant William F. Bolton. And this is more modern uniform. This woman here. She's a colonel. I'm not sure where she came from. Old uniforms and badges of the era. Western Union. This man has a, I think he's a POW, and it says, My love and greetings on Mother's Day. Hope to see you soon. Love, Arnold. 
So that's when he got out of, of the POW camp. collection or a book. Got a German deck of cards, matches. Mm, we'll wander down this way. This is a link trainer. This was what they used back up. I think they used these until the 1960s. And uh, it's basically, if you look at the instrumentation right here, it's, you're trying to keep your altitude, your heading, and your course, and it, it seems easy if you look at that right there. It seems easy until you have to do it because it's three-dimensional. It's totally different. She needs some uh, conditioner. Over here are some models. This is kind of cool. I don't know what this is. That looks like it's real metal, actually. Oh, security guard badges. We'll run airport. That's old school there. Back to World War II, you had ration cards which I actually have some of these ration cards and stickers. And this is the conversion table that tells you how many points you get for what. what they used to have to limit how you can get. And the people who had cars were worth money. You had different categories of how much gas you could buy per week, depending on what you were, you were into. The uh, military, uh, the government used to distribute these aircraft identifications so people could see an airplane fly over and go, you know, I saw a German fighter, I saw a Japanese plane. If you had a military member that was serving, you had that. If you had two or three people, you had two or three stars. Blue star for serving, gold star for killed in combat. Another spotter badge. This is medical equipment, the medical supplies they used to carry. And they had to carry this in the field. And the chaplain, they still do this. They still have like a suitcase and they can pull out an entire kit and do their services. And these guys are everywhere. And I'll we'll walk over here. I'm gonna circle back. A couple over here. This is an F-84 Thunderstreak in the Blue Angels paint configuration. This jet, I don't think it was very much used by the U.S. military. You can see they sold them overseas. It was a capable plane within the limits, but it, the F-86 really overshadowed it. And these stayed in service in some of these countries until the 1970s, and it's a 1950s design. And that is a F-18 Hornet. How they have one of these here is a mystery because they only had, these are actually still active duty aircraft. This was the plane that knocked out the, uh, took the F-14, the, uh, Whew, yeah, the F-14. Remember Top Gun? Yeah, this is a plane that superseded it. The uh, F-14 was relegated to an attack aircraft, and it got retired in 2006. So this took over. And if you look, single seat. It's important. I'll talk about that in a minute. This is an OV-1, better known as a bird dog. It is a, uh, excuse me, an O-2, wrong airplane, O-2. It is a plane used in Vietnam as a spotter for for uh, airstrikes and ground strikes, and it has the interesting thing that you, the part that it has an engine in the front and an engine in the back, kind of referred to as a push pull. Now, the problem with the rear engine is it overheated a lot. It had a real bad problem with that because you're not getting a lot of cooling air. It also burned a lot of fuel, so when they were cruising between targets, they would run the back engine at idle and let it cool, but when they got into the part where they were actually flying around dropping rockets, they would flip that engine back on. This is also called a Cessna Skymaster. And I knew a guy who actually flew these in the military. And he had one in 1973, one of the last units that had them. And he was in Alaska, was taken off on a morning flight, rotated, came off the ground and hit a moose. And uh, tumbled down the runway, broke his legs. And he got to go down in history as the only person shot down by a moose. And we have some maps. Some old newspaper clippings of the era. That's there's your fuel rations right there. That tastes like three gallons. Wow, people saved this stuff for all these years. Okay, that's cool. And people donated all this stuff. This museum. 
I'm going to wander back over here and show you the Norden bomb site. I noticed when I was in here the other day, or a month ago, <laughs> that ain't, that ain't going to fly too fast with no motors for us. And I will wander back over here. Folding wingtips, that's so it fits inside a carrier deck. You can make more aircraft fit in there. Just, uh, walk with me back over here. This right here is an aircraft tug. If you've ever watched a old black and white documentary about carrier battles, that's the first thing that rolls off the ship into the ocean. This is a 1940-ish model vehicle, and the staff told me they still used it until about about 10 years ago. They still tugged, tugged aircraft. Thank you. All right, again, this guy here, Staff Sergeant Fernand Duhatti was a gunner. And that would be the training manual in then and now the military uses comic book format for training manuals. I don't know why that is, but unless you play like a video game that simulates being a gunner, you would not understand how difficult that is to do. Turret gunner, little guy in the belly of the ship, most dangerous job you can find. There's a crew. One of the pilots. He's got his leather jacket. Oh, is that what they're talking about? Oh, they're not. Oh, the 18. Oh, yeah. It's a good mock up here. It says, Well, I tried. <laughs> the leather flying hat, that's kind of what it looked like. The B 24 was much bigger inside than the B 17. This is kind of a cutaway. Kind of hard to see because it's so small. But it was a bigger aircraft. This is the Norden bomb site. This was the super secret bomb site the military was all proud of and what happens is you get over by your target you start a, a bomb run which is you hit the initial point which is usually you know five ten miles out and from the initial point you have to fly in a straight line no matter who's shooting at you or what explosions are going off and you fly in a straight line the bombardier sticks his face in the site there's dials and wheels and buzzers and stuff all around this and based on altitude airspeed and crosswinds, they would dial in the target and drop the bombs. I don't know where the switch is. There's probably a toggle somewhere different. But this is the control panel of the aircraft, of B-24. That one there, right there with the strip on it, when they would get over the target, the pilot would hit all those toggles to the right. He, the big bar, then all the little ones in the middle. He literally turned over control of the aircraft to the bombardier. And the bombardier would fly the aircraft with fine-tuning trimming and then when they would do bombs away he would hand the aircraft back over the pilot would reach up reach up and grab that'll switch and just flip it over and all the switches to go where they are right now so he would immediately take control of the aircraft so technically on the bomb run the bombardier was flying and this is a sign for the willow run plant i'll read it because it's probably hard to see Willow Run, 1953 to present. Willow Run initially referred to a small stream running through this area. The name then identified the bomber factory, airport, and community which sprung up around the wartime industry. Now this, whoop, here we go. Now this Willow Run plant is the General Motors Hydromatic Division, makers of automatic transmissions. First base in Detroit, this division moved from Livonia, where fire destroyed the facility in August of 1953. That September, General Motors transferred the hydromatic operation to Willow Run 12 weeks after the fire. Transmissions again rolled off the totally retooled and rearranged assembly line, the amazing feat of industrial efficiency. This factory was known both war and peace, continued to make transmissions. The plant also manufactured military hardware during the Korean and Vietnam conflicts. Willow One reflects the versatility of the auto industry. But this was a super secret. The Norden bombsite was super secret during its time. One over here, U.S. paratrooper outfit. He's got a Thompson submachine gun. Got ammo, sitting on an ammo crate. This is Japanese. These are probably souvenirs from the war. And little teeny tiny grenades. That is a type of bomb you light and throw. The Japanese had these flags, and they would wear them around their waist. 
and their family members and their neighbors would sign their name to it and then they would wear it as a good luck charm and that was like a that was like the ultimate prize for a souvenir for a GI and World War II outfits artifacts how's that for a cell phone <laughs> they say it's a, a walkie talkie how did that name slip through why don't you call a rifle a pointy shooty you know seriously Again, souvenirs from the war, people bring these back. Rank. They have lots of, the Germans love their ceremonial knives. And armbands. This is a display of the Doolittle Raid, 1942, the Japanese hit Pearl Harbor. They were making gains everywhere. And they tied down B-25, 16 of them, with Gen General Jimmy Doolittle there in the black in front there and they flew them off the coast of Japan flew into Japan bombed them didn't really do any damage to speak of but it definitely got their attention and I will be moving along here somebody's cards here right. it's kind of going out of order here because there's a whole lot more people in here than I thought we're gonna look here so let's walk over here for a second that is the f-84 from back here again Blue Angels markings and this is a display just for the Blue Angels by the way that's what airline seats used to look like this is not a photograph this is some kind of a, a lithiograph oh, that's shiny that's kind of cool and here's all the maneuvers they do another one of those skinny guys The old T-38s used to be the Air Force's uh, Thunderbirds. Now they use uh, F-16s. They used to use T-38s. They went, to, I mean, F-4, T-38, and now they're using the F-16. There it is. That's an F-16. Well, how are you doing? This is a display. This is 1970s, possibly early 80s. Look at those sweet sideburns. Of their displays. Ah, there they are again. Helmet. My watermelon head would not fit in that. More equipment. My watermelon wouldn't fit in that either. And this is just some guy's personal stuff. I guess he's, he's gone now and he, their family probably donated all this. I'll walk you back over here. So they have an F-84 Thunderbirds and a Blue Angels bird. That's, <laughs> that's kind of cool. And we're going to walk over here. Okay, now by a wide margin, the most awesome aircraft in this museum is this right here. This is an AH-1 Cobra. It's a J model. This is a twin-engine version. This is what the Marines use. I flew the single-engine model. And when I got here, the first time this aircraft showed up on site, I was actually telling these people part stuff about it. <laughs> they didn't know, which I thought was funny. Here's your ammo compartment right there. And they didn't know that was an ammo compartment. We opened it up and there was components in there and I had to kind of show them where they went. This is an older model. And one of the ways of telling that is the canopy. If you look, the canopy is round and that is old school. And the problem with that is not unlike a car windshield. If the sun is glinting off that, the enemy can see it. And if you come over here, the sun is still glinting off it because it's round. No matter where you are, you're going to get a reflection. Also, the aircraft flies. I mean, you're, it hovers like this, but it flies like this. So when you're flying, the guy in the back seat is literally looking through this up here, and the cockpit lights glow up here, and it would blind them. So they went to what's called flat plate canopy, and if you go online look up a picture of a Cobra, AH-1 Cobra, you'll see pictures of the flat plate canopy. Also, that is a square rotor blade. That's old school. That's a B-540 rotor system. Now the newer ones have a 747. They're tapered. That's a 20 millimeter cannon. This used to be a uh, six barrel Gatling gun, but they, they restricted it. That gun will go 110 degrees this way, 110 degrees that way, 60 degrees down, 
13 to 21 degrees up so you don't shoot yourself down. The model I flew had a sighting system on the front. This doesn't happen. Like I said, this is a whole different setup with a twin engine. I've actually flown one of these one time and my gross weight was 10,000. This gross weight is 14 and it flies like a pig. This is the F4 Phantom. This is living proof. And if you give a brick enough horsepower, it will fly. This also left a big trail of smoke. These were first came online in 1957, which was way ahead of its time. And the last unit retired them in 1987. And that was a National Guard unit. And one of the massive design flaws of this aircraft is it doesn't have a gun. As I was saying, that guy's got a 20 millimeter cannon. He has no gun because the thinking of the era was missiles were gonna be the thing. That's a radar dome right there. So the thinking was, you're not going to use a gun anymore. The aircraft was actually designed to intercept bombers. So when they got into war in Vietnam, they had to use missiles for everything. And the missile technology of the 1960s was, let's say, pathetic. The reliability of the missiles was terrible. And to use a Sparrow air-to-air -air missile, you had to get behind the bad guy for like five seconds. Which, five seconds in combat is like uh, five seconds being on fire. And the missile had to agree that you were locked on, you pull the trigger, and the missile either flew and hit the target, or it flew by the target, or you pulled the trigger and the missile fell off the railing and disappeared into space. There was no, there was no pattern to it. It was just, it was terrible. The, the actual success rate of missile shots from these aircraft during the war was 11%. If they just would have had a gun, it would have made all the difference in the world. Oh, there's some sweet-ass models. I like that. This is a mock-up. The KC-135 Stratotanker, old school, good for pictures. I'm almost certain it didn't have that seat. So you've got 